In order to live an extraordinary and abundant life, you must focus on your internal battle and win within. My name is Randy Wilson, and welcome to the Rich Mind Podcast. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Rich Mind Podcast. And today, going coming back with, this is going to be a fun conversation. We were just talking or chatting before we hit record here. We've had a little bit of technical issues today, but we've got them hammered out. And we're super excited to do so because this conversation, as I mentioned, is going to be a lot of fun. Today, I have with us Jeremy Hasselwood. And Jeremy's coming to us from Atlanta, Georgia. Jeremy is a former recording artist. And we're going to get into the type of music and his journey within the recording industry. He's a two-time best-selling author, an inspiring keynote speaker, and a digital marketing consultant. He has a deep passion for helping individuals maximize their talents and purpose, which has led him to his most recent project, which is his book. And we're going to dive deep into his book as well. And that book is called Finding Your Edge. And EDGE is an acronym. I won't get into what that acronym is right here in the beginning. We'll get into uh, deeper details about that book, but I'm super excited to dive into that with the subtitle of How to Unlock Your Talents and Purpose. I think a lot of times folks uh, are struggling with that idea of finding and discovering what their talents are, what their purposes are. Uh, he and I are about the same age. We were just talking about that earlier as well. We grew up in the 90s, uh, kind of put some math in there. Everybody knows I'm 50. I won't, I'll let him describe how old he is if he would like. I'm not going to put him on, the, on the, the hot seat there. But at the same time, we're, we're about that same age. So we've got a little bit of experience in life. And sometimes as you get a little older, you have a little bit of wisdom to share. And today, I think this conversation is going to be full of wisdom for sometimes even that younger generation or even folks that are our age that are actually out there trying to figure out what their purpose is. Why are they here? Mm -hmm. What are they trying to do? And this story and his story is going to be a lot of fun. So without further ado, Jeremy, come on the show, man. This can be, this can be a lot of fun. Welcome. I'm ready. Let's go. Thanks for having me on here. Yeah, this is going to be great. So I went through the high level bullet point list of some things about you, but I would love for you to take a few minutes and go as deep as you would possibly can. As far as your story, I mentioned you're being a recording artist. Uh, you're a two-time bestselling author now. I don't need to go through the bullet point list again, but at the same time, yeah, please share with everybody a little bit more about yourself. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, you know, live in the Atlanta area now and the way that I got here and everything that led up to today has certainly been a, a very interesting journey. I'm originally from Oklahoma and kind of back and forth between Oklahoma City and Guthrie, you know, product of divorced parents. So, you know, kind of got town life and then suburban Oklahoma City life, you know, even though Oklahoma City is still pretty small. Um, but yeah, so it, it, I like to say I followed my dream and found my purpose. I left home, if you will, when I was 20 years old, not even old enough to legally drink and was had a dream to pursue music. So a friend of mine that I did music with, we moved to Atlanta for a summer and was like, hey, let's give it a summer. Let's see how we like it out here. And if we like it, we'll stay. If it's not good, then we'll just come back home. Many years later, I'm still here in Atlanta. So, um, and I know we can we can unpack a whole lot of that in here. Um, but man, there's so much um, that we can talk about today, just as far as even having a dream, going after your dream, and if it doesn't happen the way that you think that you or the way that you intend it to happen, like the lessons that you learn along the way, and the way that you really learn and rebuild yourself and refocus and discover who you are along that path pivots are what I call them. There's life is mm -hmm. just full of pivots. And from yeah. what I have, the research I've done on you and your journey and your story, especially there at the beginning with, you know, chasing after that dream of being a recording artist and, and producing content as far as your music, mm -hmm. it sounds like you went through several pivots in that process. Take me back. You know, you, you mentioned you were 20. I can think back to when I was 20 mm -hmm. and, and just having the courage to kind of step into that. Kind of take me yeah. back to what that was like then, uh, leaving a smaller town. You mentioned Oklahoma City, maybe not being as big, but definitely not as probably not as big as Atlanta. Yeah, tell for me, sure. Tell me more about that. Yeah, how was that yeah. challenge for well, you? Well, yeah, and the crazy thing too that you mentioned, like twenty years old. Like I have three kids, and they're all in their twenties now, and I'm just looking at them like, why? Wow, I can't believe that I moved when I was twenty to a whole different state. Like I have some family, I have an aunt out here in the Atlanta area, but outside of that. Um, there was a, a friend that I had out here, but I didn't really know anybody. So, but that, that whole process was, 
I was in college, very passionate about creating music. Like back in high school, like I put out a cassette. It was my friend and I, we have a group or had a group and, you know, I bust tables on the weekends and all that money that we I made from busting tables. We go to the studio, record, you know, put out our first album. Like, you know, we got the photographers and I helped design the cover and found like a local cassette manufacturer and pressed up, I think maybe like 300 copies or something and was selling them out of my locker at school and out of my car and wherever I could sell them. Like that's what I was doing. So that was in high school. So in college, I'm like, I really went to college so I could learn business because I never wanted to just be an artist. I wanted to understand the business of music and business period, because, you know, when you think of especially like music or the arts, you know, there can be not an expiration date, but at some point you kind of fall into needing to know your business period. You know, if you're just an artist and all you're doing is creating, whether it's painting or recording and you're not paying attention to the business, then you have a a possibility that your money will be mismanaged or there's going to be a lot of people who have their hands in your money uh, that really don't need to have it. So the more that I knew, the better off and more control that I could have. So uh, so in school, you know, actually I moved out here to, I started at the University of Oklahoma uh, when it got to a point where I I really just couldn't take it anymore. And, And when I say that, I mean, I had so much passion built up for the music. I was like, I, I have to move. And the friend I was doing music with, I was like, look, I'm moving to Atlanta. I want you to come with me. But if you don't come with me, like I'm going anyway, because I just need to see what's going to happen with this. And, you know, he's like, well, you know, we talked back and forth, came back the next day, said, let's go. So that's when we made our plan. And we kind of felt like there was some safeguards there because, you know, I did have an aunt here and she's still here in Atlanta uh, that we could stay with for the summer, thankfully. And so there was a little bit of a safety net. And if it didn't work, we could always go back home and, you know, go back to life. Having that, you know, even the idea and following what that dream was, like following a calling. I think a lot of people don't do that. They discount the reasons and say all the ways that it won't work. But man, I'm so grateful that I started that journey because that completely talk about a pivot like that completely changed the trajectory of my life you know i'm i'm sitting here on this microphone talking to you today because of that pivot if i didn't do that i don't know what i'd be doing you know but we probably wouldn't be talking right now that hindsight right when you look back you just wonder how in the world did you get to where you are now based on the, all that experiences right and all those things that you went through back then so the question that's coming to my mind i think a lot of times uh, maybe young folks, in, I've, I've got children in their twenties as well. So I kind of look at them and think, you know, some of the things as far as the things that I did back then and trying to watch them do other things as well. But the question I had was how much support did you get from family, from friends to make such a big move like that? Right. I mean, you think about moving out, of, moving out of your parents' house, right. Moving, going down the street, maybe staying in town, but you know, to move, uh, you know, several States away, did you have support? Did you have, uh, you sounds like you had your friend, your, your buddy that was helping you produce and create the content or create the music. Yeah. How was this, your support system for yourself going yeah. up to that? that age Actually, of yeah, it was really good. Uh, there, my friends, my family, everybody was supportive. Like even my parents, they, their main concern was they wanted me to finish school and they were like, well, you've, you've got three years of college. Why would you move when you, you have three years of college already done? Like you're going to move and you may not finish. I'm like, I'm going to finish because it's important to me and I want to get that degree. I want to understand business. So that that's not a concern. But they I think that was their only um, I don't know if we call it a concern, but maybe hesitation was they wanted me to make sure that. I, they always said, just have something to fall back on. Like my parents always kind of put that in me. Yeah, sure. Go after this, but have something to fall back on. And so my degree, my education was something to fall back on if music didn't work out the way that I wanted it to. But I was very thankful to have that support because I mean, if I didn't, I probably would have done it anyway, because if I didn't have the support, just the kind of person I am, like I, I, I'm open to people's ideas and opinions uh, that are, especially that are close to me, but ultimately like I'm going to do what I feel is best for me, you know, and if I had people that were not pouring into me or supporting me, I probably would have done it anyway, just to prove to myself that I can do it. That's, that's super cool. So for you to have that ability from within, right. To have the courage to step into something like that without knowing the outcome, that's, that's super cool. Like you said, and then from that, you've 
done all kinds of different things that's gotten you to where you are today, which is, like I said, that's also super cool as well. So go into the, a little bit as far as, and I just think it's going to be interesting because you and I, as I mentioned, we grew up in about that same time frame. I don't want to get stuck here on the music piece because we've got so many other things that I want to cover, but I'm just, I'm curious about it as well. What's it like? Uh, so, well, here's even a, a little bit more, even a deeper question. Obviously, your time frame you're talking about was more of the analog stage of life, right? Before the digital age, right? Every, everything now is, and maybe it was becoming, you can answer that question. Yeah, you know, maybe you can answer that. How hard was it back then? It's like you you mentioned uh, producing music on cassette tapes. <laughs> There's people out here that don't even know what a cassette tape is. Yeah. Anyways, my point or the question I'm asking, how difficult was it back then Versus, you know, even trying to do some, something similar like that to even to in today's world. Yeah. I, I could sound like the old man yelling at the cloud right now. <laughs> but it's like, these kids have it so easy now. <laughs> it's like back then, I really was coming. I would say the transition from analog to digital. So when I started recording, we're recording on like reel to reel. And I still have like some of those original reel to reels from the studio. Uh, so that that was actually really cool. But by the time I got to Atlanta, we were still using what were called like ADATs or uh, DATs, different. It was kind of like a mix of digital and, and audio. <clears throat> but, you know, eventually everything went digital and um, I used some student loan money, which I don't necessarily recommend uh, to buy my equipment. So we were producing everything in our apartment and that was all digital at that point. And even then, like it was really expensive to get the equipment and everything that you need. Whereas now, like the the barriers to entry is so low with music. It's like you don't even have to have like a, a high quality microphone necessarily. If you have like a computer and a mic, like you're good. Like you can make a whole album. Uh, so and that's why we see so many people doing music now, like whether they care about it or not. Like I did music because I really cared about the artistry of it. It wasn't just something for me to do or a hobby to try out because you had to invest money. Like every dollar that I earn, like all of that went into music. Whereas now, like the amount of money that you can put into music is very small. Like you need a couple of programs and a computer, which, you know, depending on your computer could be expensive or or not. But, you know. It's just the game has changed significantly. And I think with that, you've also seen, um, you know, a a lot of uh, quantity over quality when it comes to music, because anybody can make music now. Whereas back in the day, back in the day, back when I was coming up, (laughs) you you really had to devote time and effort and really care about the music, Um, especially if you're paying studio time. Like you can't go in there and just like mess around like you got to have everything ready, rehearsed and all that before you hit the studio. Back in the day, I love Back I just, you day. saying that. Yeah, I can just hear. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> it's it's yeah. amazing. Old to think man about how Jeremy long, here. Yeah, that, well, old man Randy as well, right? I'm right there with you. I'm actually older yeah, than yeah, you. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I think that's that's super cool. I appreciate you sharing that. So we've talked about pivots. And at some point you got to that journey or within your journey of kind of deciding or realizing that maybe this wasn't going to be what you thought it was. Take me through to that part of the story as far as when you came to that conclusion and then what you do from there. Yeah. It's, it's like a whole movie, man. Like the time in Atlanta, especially early to mid twenties, you know, the things that we used to do here, like I mean, we performed at almost every venue here in Atlanta and that's no exaggeration. And we've opened up, you know, when we were doing, you know, we opened up for some pretty decent size and some big artists at the time. So we had some successes. Uh, we actually had a song that, Uh, I made for the Oklahoma football team that became like the based on the spins in Oklahoma city and Tulsa was like number 98 on national pop radio. So I'm like, Hey, I I got like a top 100 pop radio hit and it never left the state of Oklahoma. Um, So we had some successes, you know, we got to perform at Showtime at the Apollo on national TV, which was great. And then the not so great, we were booed off the stage at on national TV at Showtime at the Apollo. But we had these, you know, little pieces of success here and there. We put out an independent album um, ourselves. We self-funded it. Uh, it kind of took me back to like high school. And, you know, we created the covers and the photography shoots and designed it. So we actually had a say in everything, which if you if you're signed for a record label, which was our goal, like you don't have as much control, you know, they kind of tell you, here's 
what we're going to do. And some of the stuff is whether you like it or not, this is what it's going to be. But as independent, you're doing it 100% yourself, like you are 100% in control of your project. So that piece I really appreciated. But when we talk about the pivot, it's like get to be late 20s and the music we're still not, it's still feast or famine, you know, and we were not feasting and we have lives to live. Um, my, my partner just got married and I had a son, still have a son. It's not like I don't have a son anymore. Um, but it's like things in life started to change and you have to really ask yourself, like, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? You know? And also the industry itself, um, a lot of it is what you hear, the cliches and there's a dark side and, you know, just kind of the cutthroat and it just didn't really sit right with my spirit. Like I just wanted to create music and art for people to enjoy. And the business side of it was really a turnoff for me. And it became a, a job that I despised. So, which was really, and that's why I had to pivot because it was really sad because ever since I was a teenager, like this is what I wanted to do. This was my dream. And I went after this dream and it just turned into something that was, didn't really satisfy me and, and kind of made me sad in a way. Um, so I had to pivot and figure out what do I do now? And I didn't really know what to do because all my contacts were either within the music industry or, um, you know, I'm working like a nine to five to support my industry, which was with a telecom company. And I'd been there for several years. So it's like my contacts were either music industry or telecom. And I didn't want to do either. Like I hated my job, you know, the telecom job, it, it really was for me to pay bills and fund music, but not necessarily, it wasn't a career that I wanted because my career was going to be, you know, music, entertainment, things like that. So I went through this period of a couple of years where I'm like, what am I even supposed to be doing? I have no idea because everything I thought life was going to be, it's totally different. And it's like, I'm having to hit reset and figure out what do I do now? And I was totally like blank piece of paper, had no idea what to do. I can pause here if you have a question or I can keep going. No. So, yeah. So that, that would be the question. Okay. So what did okay. you do? I think once again, so people get to points in their life and then yeah. it's like, what do I do now? They're at a, they're at a fork in the road yep. and it's, they need to make a decision, but it's like, they can't even see the roads in front of them. They don't know what to do. So yeah, that was going to be my question. So if you want to okay. continue, please, what cool, did cool. you do to try to figure out what that was for yourself? Having no idea where you wanted to do or go from there. Yeah. Um, I didn't even know where to start, you know, so I'm reading some books here and there. Like I'm talking to friends and family, asking them, because I think sometimes that's okay. You seek help and your friends and family, the people close to you that you can trust, like they might see something in you that you don't see. And, and that's really where I started because like, that's the immediate environment. So it's like, I remember asking my grandfather, like, you know, what do you think I'm good at? And you know, he didn't, he didn't have a response necessarily that's memorable. It was just like, you know, you're you know nice and you're good at sales. And I'm like, I hate sales. I don't want to do sales. Um, so it's really like reflecting on what, what did I do from the time that I moved to Atlanta up to this point and looking at my experiences and looking at the areas in which I've grown, the skills that I've picked up along the way, uh, identifying what was it about music that I really, that really moved my spirit or that I was able to give back to people. And so I started journaling. Um, then I also went back to school, uh, got my master's degree. Um, and, and I can say that program was also transformative for me because I was assigned a coach within that program that I work with a lot. And he was able to pull a lot of stuff out of me and help me kind of tap in and, and discover things about myself. One of the things that I landed on was like with music, like I, it was a talent that I had, it was a passion that I had, but it wasn't my purpose. And I started to kind of, uh, put together this ideology about passions and purpose and talents and how these are three very specific and unique things. And I think a lot of times people equate, if I'm passionate about something, it's my purpose. And that's not necessarily the case. I was passionate about music, but looking back, like that was not my purpose. You know, I was talented at music, but that was not my purpose. Um, however, I do think that your purpose can lie at the intersection of your talents and your passions. And I'm not saying it will, but I'm saying it can. I think there's something there. And, th and that's the work that I had to do when I looked at my talents, my passions, which was music and creating. And, you know, what was it about the music and the creating that really moved me? And where's the purpose in there? 
And I can tell you the most gratifying thing for me when I was doing music was for people to hear a song or see a performance and just how it changed, it shifted their emotion. So if someone hears a song, like I've had people call me, text me, send me messages saying that there's certain songs I made that actually made them cry. I'm like, wow, that's powerful. Like to hear a piece of art and to have an emotional response like that, like you've like somebody needed to hear that. Um, There were people who told me that they decided to go to the university of Oklahoma because of the song that I created. And I'm like, wow, like they just committed like tens of thousands of dollars to a university because of a song I made. Uh, which I didn't make any money off of, by the way, but <laughs> the school made money off of. So good for them. But so I started to think about like, that's the piece that really gets me. And what it all boiled down to me was like hope and being able to give people hope and my messaging, uh, my personality, the way that I, I want to treat people, the way that I want to be remembered. I want to be that inspiration to people when they are lost and trying to figure something out and recognizing that, you know, through my own journey, like all I had to rely on was like hope, you know? So it's like, I, I, I have a hope for a better day. I don't know what's happening right now today, but I know this is not where I'm supposed to be. So my hope is that tomorrow is going to look different, but then it's like, what am I going to do to make that hope fulfilled? Love that. So the skill sets that you've acquired through your 20s, right? With the recording. Uh, I know you said you had a little bit of corporate experience as well. I think you, at some point you went into a digital marketing company, right? Uh, as far as you did that for a corporate position, which then gave you some more skills. So you've got this entrepreneurial bug. You're obviously very creative. And I think that's why I'm drawn to you and your story as well, because I consider myself that as well. I, like you said, and I feel the same way. When I create a piece of content or create a, a clip or a video or, or even the podcast and somebody gets moved by that in any way, shape or form. It doesn't have to be uh, super emotional, but at the same time where they really appreciated it. That, Like you said, there's nothing better. There's nothing better feeling to take your creativity, a, a vision that you have, create it, put it out there in the world and have someone inspired or, or like it or enjoy it, right? Something like that. So that resonates with me a ton. So take a minute though, as far as talk about the skills that you acquired from your recording history through then into the corporate world. We talked a little bit before we jumped on uh, record today as far as this episode. And we talked about how I think a lot of times people, in the, and this has been my experience, I think it is for you as well. They think that just becoming an entrepreneur or going out there and starting your own business, that you're going to go from working today and leaving it all behind and, and going to do it all on your own by yourself tomorrow. Right. And I, I think that that's, it comes across maybe some that sometimes that way on social media and that how that is not necessarily the case at all. Meaning uh, doing side gigs, uh, just working in general in support of your passions and your talents and trying to gain those skill sets to try to become successful at this in, in the entrepreneurial landscape. Just curious what your thoughts are there. Yeah. For me, it was while I'm trying to either, whether it's doing music or even now with my, digital marketing consultancy, which I've had for 10 years now, it's like, I didn't just, you know, not have a job while I'm doing music or just say I'm leaving the corporate world and I'm going to start a digital marketing consultancy. Like I would not recommend that somebody to, I would not recommend you do that. I'm, I'm not saying don't do that, but if you do that, like your risk is super high, you know? And so it's like, if you're, if you're willing to just cold turkey, quit a job and not have a plan and just say, I'm going to make something happen. Like, I'm not going to say not to do that, but I am going to say you're really taking a tremendous risk with that. And and you need to have some kind of backup plan in place. Give yourself some timelines around it. Now, for me, it's like I, I didn't have the luxury of doing a high risk thing like that. Like I need a place to live. You know, I have a son, you know, I have a family now, so I can't just say, hey, you know what? I'm going to quit this. And try to work on whatever gift or talent or business this is. So what I did was, you know, I had a job, I had a nine to five, even like I started my company, my company now is called Ampla Marketing. And I started that as a result of a layoff. And the idea was, okay, I was laid off from a, a marketing agency and I really love the work. And this is the kind of work that I want to do. 
So I'm going to start my own thing, but I know that I can't necessarily support myself out the gate. So while I'm starting this, I'm looking for jobs and I'm going on interviews. In fact, I, I held one or two additional jobs while I was starting up my company. And then it got to a point where I got a good sized client and the risk was lower. It didn't mean that there was no risk because I still wasn't making the same amount of money from this one client that was replacing my income, but it was enough of a momentum and enough. Of, I wouldn't even say a cushion. It was a, it was a big enough start for me to really focus on that client. And now we can start building other clients. So uh, and it doesn't work like that for everybody. I was fortunate that that was even the case. You know, that came after two to three years of having my company. So a lot of people think that I'm going to start a company in you know, three months, six months, whatever, like this is going to be my life. And that, that may be your situation and that's wonderful. But what if it's not, what if it's two years, three years, four years, five years, um, is that going to be okay? Like it's not an easy road and it's still not now, you know? If I lose a certain number of clients, like I'm, you know, I'm no different from someone that's still trying to make things work. You know, I, I'm my company has grown almost every year since I started, which is great. But there's no guarantee. You know, every day I've got to work and I've got to, you know, make things happen. Entrepreneurship is is fun, is exciting. There's freedom in it, um, but you, it's also not for everybody. You know, you have to be organized. You have to be disciplined. Um, and, and if you don't have those kinds of qualities like it's going to be really hard yes communication being able to communicate oh, well yeah yeah i mean you're talking to people good all the time yeah true because you because I, I rely on partnerships a lot and if people don't want to work with you like you're not gonna be their partner anymore you know um but i'm like i'm always like how can we work together and how can it be a win-win situation Love that as well. That's what I'm, so we talked about our kids in our twenties and I'm encouraging my kids. And then you out there, the listeners today is that while you're working in your jobs, think about the skill set that you're trying to acquire. And part of that is this communication piece, right? Determining whether people can be partners with you, even in a working environment, you can figure out different ways of communication. Uh, you mentioned sales. That's a big part of it as well. Uh, marketing, which is what your business is now. I love marketing as well. But even just creating this podcast for myself, right? I've gone through the process. Uh, I'm producing it 100% myself. Any, you know what I mean? But it's a skill set that I'm building. Whether I decide at some point to turn it into a service, we'll, we'll see. But the point is, I just want people to hear is that it doesn't necessarily always happen overnight. I think a lot of times we get in a hurry uh, when we can just be in the process of building that skill set, building that desire, building that, you know, not knowing what it is. You the road might be fuzzy in front of you, right? You might not have a clear picture, but if you keep taking steps, keep trying, keep figuring out what that next step is, but then stepping into it and having the courage to do so, I think that's the biggest takeaway from your story up to this point, Jeremy. And that's what I appreciate you've shared so far. Yeah. And let me say real quick too, like, because what you're saying is similar to the things that even that I instill in my kids, it's really like, multiple talents, multiple checks, you know? So when you're going through this road of entrepreneurship, you're developing new talents, being able to monetize your different skills that you have and not just do one thing. So even though I'm doing marketing, like, like you, like you're doing podcasts, you're an author. I see your book back there. I see it back there. You're an author. So you have a talent at that. So it's like you have multiple talents. So let's you know, let's get multiple checks from this. And it doesn't mean every check is going to be big, but a little here, a little there. So like, let's take inventory of our skills and we want to be focused because if you have 10 skills and you're trying to get 10 checks, you maybe can't do that all at the same time. So let's prioritize, you know, how we can monetize the skills that we have. But that's one thing that was kind of instilled in me through actually, um, during my music era, like the manager that I had at the time was like, Hey, you guys, right. You produce, like you do all this stuff yourself, you're self-contained, like multiple talents, multiple checks. I'm like, cool. Like, and even now that's kind of how I operate. You know, there's the books, there's speaking, there's consultancy. So how can you take inventory of your skills and figure out how can we make money off of this and create a living off of it? That's great. Yeah, that's exactly. So my kids have all had, they're in the early twenties, but they've all had multiple jobs, whereas they could have been considered careers for certain individuals, but they have gone in, gotten the skill, whenever they determined that they wanted to get from that, that position, that job, 
whether they didn't necessarily care for it anymore or felt pretty proficient in it, they've gone and then found the next thing they wanted to get skillful at, which is, that's what I'm encouraging them to do. I think they get a little antsy <laughs> wondering when is it going to, like you said, multiple skills or, or multiple, I don't want to put words in you. I'd say that again, multiple skills, yeah, multiple, multiple checks. talents, multiple talents, multiple checks. Love that. So yeah, yeah I think they're getting a little antsy because they're not seeing too many checks yet either, but they're building a toolbox of skills that is going to be marketable to whatever they choose in the future, whether that's five years, 10 years. And that's what I would love for folks to hear us saying out there today. What skills can you acquire that can be marketable in the marketplace, right? That are, that people will uh, use and consume. Uh, we talked about that with Jeremy with his skill set as far as his uh, recording history. And obviously then now he's turned into a marketing consultancy, which that's that's super cool. I appreciate that. So let's let's pivot a little bit. Let's go into finding your edge. We've talked a little bit about passions and purpose and talents. I would love to go as deep as you're willing and let's help some folks find some hope, find some purpose. Uh, let's dive into into your latest project, your book there, Finding Your Edge. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So Finding Your Edge, How to Unlock Your Talent and Purpose um, is my book. And this really came about from this journey that we've been talking about this whole time. And uh, within this book, I weave some personal stories in there, but then also frameworks that I put together almost for survival, if you will, like, how do I get out of this rut? How do I gain focus? And, you know, putting this in a format where it was therapeutic for me and, and it was helpful for me just living it and then writing about it. And I was like, if I came from a place where I thought I knew what my career or life was going to look like. And then all of a sudden I didn't know and having to rediscover myself. I'm not the only person that has had to go through that. And when I was writing the book and I was telling people about the book and, and breaking down the different chapters, people were like, wow, I need to read that. Like that applies to me because there's so many people I've met the past few years that like they're working in jobs and they like their jobs, but a lot of them don't like their jobs. And they're doing it because, you know, this is what we do. Like we, we have to have a job because we have to have money coming in, but it doesn't satisfy me. It doesn't, uh, like I dread going to work every day. And, that, and that's kind of where I was. Like, I remember just looking up at the building that I worked at and like my stomach would drop and I would just be like, oh man, I, <sighs> all right, let's do this. Like eight hours, just one day at a time, you know, one day at a time. <laughs> so talking myself through it. And there's a lot of people that feel that way. And so that was part of my journey, but edge, like let's get into like the acronym because edge is an acronym and there's multiple meanings and edge in, in itself is the end of one thing and the beginning of another thing. So I like to think of it like finding your edge is like, what are we leaving and what are we walking into? And, and that thing, the end of one thing is like the life that you have right now and how it looks now. And the new beginning is the life that you're creating. And this is a, a life that is created with intent, with purpose, with goals, with discipline. Um, and so the acronym for edge, and I walk through this in my book is eliminate distractions discover yourself, generate goals, and enact discipline. And it's really a step-by-step -step thing. You have to follow it in that order because we can't generate goals and start. We can't start there, which I think a lot of people do. They want to like today say, okay, I'm going to start writing some goals for this month. And I would say, hold up. Let's, before we do that, like let's get into a place where we better understand ourselves so that these goals that we create are actually in line with who we are as a human being and our talents and our passions and our purpose. Because if you're creating goals without doing the work, considering those items, then your goals may not really be the goals you think you want, you know? Uh, so that's kind of where we would start. And it really is eliminating distractions because if you can't clear your mind and focus on cre creating space for yourself to grow, then you won't be able to do the work on yourself, you know? Love that. So do you have any suggestions? Distractions are everywhere, right? People are distracted 24-7, 365 in today's environment, today's world. Uh, I agree with that. You've got to get crystal clear on what's going on within yourself, right? And to do that, you need to get uh, calm, get quiet, right? Be Eliminate those distractions. Help me help the listeners today with some of that. Like, what are your some of your suggestions? Yeah. Well, first of all, we need to know what our distractions are. And I think we oftentimes are 
in this sea of distractions that we never really agreed to join because that's how life is. That's how culture is. That's how technology is. So, you know, our, our phones, where's my phone? Which is odd. Oh, it's over here. It's usually like right here. It's still within an arm's <laughs> length away. Um, yeah. So phone yes, like, mine is too. Yeah. It's like most people, that's what it is. And I would say if I were to do a survey, which I haven't, I would say that that's probably going to be 90% of people is our biggest distraction because there's so much within the phone. Like our lives are in our phone, our calendars, our social media, games, stocks, news, whatever. So, you know, so it's taking inventory. And part of the things in my book is like, I have you create a list of your distractions and they're not always necessarily physical items. You know, it may not be a phone or a gaming system. It could be things like people. I guess people is a physical item. It could be food. It could be uh, movies or television. Uh, So it's, but it's identifying like how much time am I spending each day or each week with things that are not really building me up or helping me fulfill my purpose. It's actually taking away from that. And and I'm, I'm always like cautious when I say this because I don't want the message to be, you shouldn't be on your phone or watch TV or play games or eat. We need to eat, you know? So it's like, how can we recognize what's healthy and what's not healthy? And if you're spending three hours a night watching TV or gaming or having phone conversations with people that may not necessarily be a a good person for you, maybe they're very needy friend or toxic and you might be that needy or toxic friend. I don't know. So, and, and that's, that's a whole separate book in itself. But uh, but understanding what those distractions are, <clears throat> because once you understand them, you can start to manage them a little bit better. So setting those boundaries is what it's kind of what I'm hearing you say, meaning setting boundaries. So for myself, even with social media, I'm not going to sit here and act like I'm not on social media and I'm not probably as much as some, but I, I allow myself to get distracted sometimes, but then I catch myself and it's like, okay, I need to put this away, you know, put the phone in another room, you know, just away. Like you said, not within arm's distance of myself. Literally mine is turned off right now as we speak, because I don't want to get distracted during this conversation. Uh, so yeah. So boundaries, is that a big piece of that? That's kind of what I'm hearing you say. I think that is one piece. I think boundaries are, are certainly a piece. I think also schedule your distractions, you know, So if you need that distraction, and I think there's some healthiness to that because sometimes we just need to check out. We need to do mindless things and and that's okay. It's more than okay, but schedule it and know like, okay, from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m., that's my time to engage with this distraction or whatever. But when that time is up, that time is up. So that's one is like, and and you could consider that a boundary as well because you're creating a space for that. But I also think like removing yourself, like, doing something outside of your norm, like create a space in your home or somewhere else, whether it's a a coffee shop or here in Atlanta, I used to go to Kennesaw mountain and I would just go up to the, the top of the mountain and I would just sit there and I would think I would write, but creating that space where my mind can actually not be engaged with something and I can be engaged with myself and what I'm trying to do. Like that was super helpful for me uh, just to kind of not cut the cord, but just to create a different space for myself. Because I think if we're in the same environment, doing the same thing over and over, it's a little bit harder to break those distractions. And it's an intentional decision, right? You have to be intentional about that. And if, if you become intentional about it and take control of those distractions of your surroundings, that's where you can really start making some pivotal moments. We've talked about pivotal moments here in the story so far today, but you can start taking some action to get yourself in a better, with a better experience, right? Whether it's a job experience, life experience with family members, that type of thing. But that's where as stupid as it sounds, that's where this is. It all starts exactly with, with these uh, distractions and, and eliminating those as much as you possibly can. Yeah. Because like if you, because the next phase is discovering yourself, but if you're so caught up in distractions and you're not hitting pause, like you can't do the work to really discover yourself and break that cycle that you're in. So it's like you, you have to stop in order to do the work. You have to stop in order to go, I guess, you know, is one way to maybe say it, which is very, very strange, but it's true, man. Like you, you can't really do that work on yourself if you're constantly in the mix of something else and prioritizing yourself. So you said discovering yourself is the next piece, right? I think a lot of times on the podcast, that's what I'm 
trying to encourage folks is to take the time to do the internal work with themselves. I mentioned, you've mentioned a couple of times about journaling and getting yourself in a quiet place. That's the practice that I've picked up on uh, probably in the last two to three years. It's made a huge difference in my life. Getting the ideas and things that, in my, that are in my mind out on paper has made a huge difference for myself. Uh, but discovering yourself, that's the next piece. I'd love for you to go a little deeper on that. Tell me a little bit more about that for yourself. For sure. Yeah. I mean, discovering yourself and, and you can do this multiple ways. It's not just journaling. I think journaling is very important and that's all coming from inside of you. However, sometimes you need like external assistance and that could be the form of therapy. It could be a coach, someone to work with you. There may be some emotional trauma that you've had to deal with in your life that you one didn't know that you were still carrying that with you or two, you've never dealt with that. So it's still showing up in different areas of your life. So understanding what that is and how to best use that as a, a strength and not a liability. There's also different assessments you can take. Uh, you've got like, you know, Myers Briggs, uh, the disc Clifton strengths, even things like the, um, the Gary Chapman's love language quiz, like understanding these little things about yourself that you kind of know, but you don't really pay attention to. And what I always find interesting about these assessments is, you know, I'll take them, then I'll read the results and I'll, I'll always be like, oh, wow, like that's, that really is who I am. Like that characteristic resonates with me, but I didn't know it. It's like, you've got all these tools in your tool bag and you just kind of take it for granted because they're there. Like for me, for example, I have like a box with a whole bunch of tools and I know they're in there. But I don't know what all's in there until I until I go into that box. I'm like, oh, I've got this. I've got that. And I think it's the same whenever you take these assessments. You know you've got stuff in there, but you don't pay attention to it. So you don't recognize how you can use these different tools in your life and how the, also these tools might be signals of what your purpose is and what your strengths are. And when you understand these things, you understand these characteristics about yourself, like that's when you can now set goals that are in line with these tools and, and these passions and th these signals of your purpose. So that's where we're moving on to the next step with yeah. G with goals. Right? Exactly. So I think like you said, a lot of times folks and I, and I admit that I was the same way, right? You go directly to the goals without doing the, the pre-work really on yourself first. And I'm trying to do that a lot for myself now, giving myself the ability to have some space to, figure out a little bit more about myself before I start setting goals for this future that I don't know if I really want that or not. Right. Yeah. So now we're here to yeah. the goals piece. Let's, let's <laughs> exactly. dig into that. And it's like, you may think you want something, you set these goals and you're going after them and then you get there and you're like, why, why doesn't this satisfy me? Because this was a goal I set and I've accomplished it, but I still feel kind of empty. And what I find is like, because you didn't do the work up front. So do that work up front. And the goals piece is like, there, there's different ways you can set goals. And and one goal that I talk about is not anything that I invented, but it goes back to like the, the smart goals. And to me, which is like such a good model, like I'm not trying to improve that. And I did take like the A out. So it's really like SMRT. So it's like specific goals. Are they measurable? Are they realistic? And are they time bound? And without having these different elements to it, that you're probably not setting a, a very defined goal. So when I'm specific about what I want to accomplish, can I measure how I accomplished it? Whether it's even in business, you can, I want to increase something by 10%. Cool. You know, did I increase it by 10% on a personal level? My goal is to accomplish this. And did I accomplish it? Yes or no. Like that can be measured. Uh, is it realistic? And, and this is where I think a lot of people, there's some philosophical debates about how we define realistic, because is realistic really bound on the limits that we place on our mind and on ourselves. And my realistic version is whatever you think your realistic is, like, let's push that a little further, uh, you know, because you may say there's no way that I can do that. Like, I'm going to run a marathon in two weeks. Like, that's not realistic for me, you know, because I have done zero me training, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so that's not realistic. And some people are like, well, if you wake up and you exercise for 12 hours a day, you can run a marathon in two weeks. Well, I don't know. Maybe I can't. Maybe I can't. But it's not realistic because I do work for a living and I don't have that much time to put into it. So it's not realistic. Uh, and then time bound. If you're not putting time at the at your goal, assigning a time that you're going to complete your goal 
then that goal is just going to continue to drift. It's like playing in a football game and to score a touchdown, like it just, the the end zone just keeps moving. You never reach it because it's not defined. So you have to put a time bound on it. Like I'm going to accomplish X by X date. And the way that I look at this, like if you get to X date and your goal is not accomplished, it doesn't necessarily mean that you failed. Now it's time to reevaluate. We get to the deadline and the goal is not there. Well, how close are we to the goal? Like if we shift our deadline another week, another month, can we accomplish it? Because let's not negate all the work that we've done to get here. You know, maybe this timeline was a little too aggressive. You know, on the flip side, maybe you get to the timeline and you're like, man, I am nowhere close to this goal. So it might be time to pivot because I've done everything that I can do. And that's the question. Have you done everything that you can do in order to accomplish this goal? And if you haven't, then you may need to evaluate how serious of a goal this is for you. So you need to put that time into it. Um, when we look at this, like goals can be long-term, you know, three, five years, they can be short-term like this week, but just setting goals, something to keep you moving in the right direction. Like, If you're not setting goals and you're not moving, then, you know, you're just stagnant and you're you're not living in your purpose. Love that. Earl Nightingale, I refer to Earl a lot. He talks about uh, somebody without a goal is like a ship without a rudder. You're just not you're just kind of floating along. Right. You're letting the waves kind of push you around. Yeah. Uh, At some point you might crash up into the shore. But at the same time, yeah, if you can just get your get your heading, know where you're going with this goal, set a time bound to piece to it as well. I think that's super. Uh, crucial to that as well. That's that's super cool. So let's get into this last E. We've gone through the EDG. What's the last E? Let's get into that. Yeah, the last E is enacting discipline. And usually where people fail is the first and the last part of this model. Either they're not able to eliminate distractions so they can't begin the work or they are not able to enact the discipline. So, I mean, if you think about it, it's kind of a tragedy. Like if you've eliminated distractions, you've done all this work on yourself to discover who you are, you've set your goals, but then you don't have the follow through. You're not enacting discipline. It's like you did all this for nothing. And keep in mind, by the time you get to enacting discipline, you have a pretty good idea of what your purpose is in life. So if you know your purpose and you're not living it, like how disappointing is that like when are you going to realize that you've life has passed you by like are you going to be on your deathbed and you're like man i knew i was supposed to do this but i didn't do anything like i can't imagine like coming to the end of my life and just regretting not doing the things that were in my heart and and in my soul because you can't do anything about it now like that time is done it's over like you had a life you had an opportunity and that time has passed so what are you going to do today So enacting discipline, it doesn't necessarily mean every single day that you're doing something in your purpose. You can, I'm not going to say that you shouldn't, but you can, but it just means consistency. You know, you multiply your actions, you multiply your results. So part of that is linked to goals. You know, let's, you know, this week I'm going to do X, Y, Z because I want to make sure that I'm living in my purpose. I want to make sure that I'm connecting with others that these talents that I have that I am sharing them with others because it's like if you're not if you, everybody's given a gift we're all given this gift and if we're not sharing it with the world then it's to me it's kind of a selfish act and pe- there's people out there who need your gift they need your voice they need your actions they need what you can bring to the world and they're depending on you you don't even know who these people are but they are depending on you that person that you pass by in the street you know, may need to hear your voice. It may need to hear something or an action taken that's actually going to help them and change their life. Like do something today. That's awesome. So when I'm thinking about the discipline piece, as you mentioned, it's about consistency. So I'm just curious, even from your own standpoint, or maybe you've got some, some experience with other people as well. When you start down the journey of creating whatever you're working to create of, whether it's a business, we can talk about the podcast, you can talk about your journey, even through your, your digital agency. Staying in the consistency piece and the discipline to do that on a daily basis. And like, it's like you, you run into your first roadblock or you run into the first day of, yeah, I really don't feel like doing this today. Or, you know, you put the story at the very end, as far as like what the negative outcome or what the negative experience is that keeps you from taking that step, having the discipline to keep moving. 
when you have those moments, I, I believe that we all do. I, mean, mm-hmm. I, I shouldn't put words in your mouth. Yeah. I assume that you do. You wake up some days and you're like, yeah, hey, I really don't feel like doing this I'm today. I'm human right? like you for sure. Yep. Yeah. So let's let's maybe help the folks kind of uh, understand that, number one, that yes, that's normal. Yes. But what is it, some of the things that you try to do uh, for yourself to get yourself where you don't fall off completely and give up on this passion, on this purpose, right? To keep your your goal and your journey moving forward. Yeah. And I'm actually glad you brought that up because I also don't want people to be so hard on themselves. Like if they get, wake up those days and like, oh, I just don't have it in me today. Like I just can't do it today. Like, man, that is just fine. You know, have some grace for yourself because every day, like we're not, we're still human. We're not built every single day of our lives to do that. Like that's why we're supposed to rest. Our body needs rest. So it's like, you you have to give yourself grace in that. But how do you do it? For me, what works is like my schedule. Like if it's not scheduled, it does not get done. So I need to have some awareness about it for myself. And I think documentation is really important. I'm not the type that needs this, but there are people who need like maybe post-it notes, uh, reminders, things like that. And I think that's fine. I think you have to find what works for you. And this could even be like even postcards if you need something on your workspace, on your mirror at home, uh, your nightstand, uh, set reminders in your phone. Like I've got a reminder in my phone that pops up three words, uh, confident, faithful, significant. And that pops up throughout my day. And I'm no like when I'm living these three characteristics, then I'm actually the best version that I can give to myself and to the world. So it's like, I need to be confident in, in my abilities that I've been given, faithful to my creator, to my work, to my family, to what's been given to me. Um, And then significant, like making sure that what I'm doing today, like I'm making a difference, that I am significant in this world today. And every day is not going to be a 10 out of 10. You know, some days I may may suck at confidence, you know, some days I may be 10, but at least I'm aware of it. So creating these reminders, whether it's on your schedule, post-it notes, like these are the things that will remind you like, okay, I know who I am. I've done this work and let me complete the mission. You know, every day you're working to complete the mission. And some days you take a day off and that's all right. Some days you just got to slow down. Yep. I was that way a little bit with the podcast for people out there listening to, uh, about me, right? I was pushing, 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 doing a lot of interviews. And and so basically the I took almost an entire month off of doing interviews just because I was starting to feel like I was, I wasn't enjoying it as much when that, when that wasn't necessarily true, but it felt like it wasn't, I wasn't flowing when I was doing the process and I don't want that to happen, but I don't want to stop either. So I, I pulled back. I didn't stop. I just pulled back, which is going to allow me then to spring forward, which is what I'm hearing you say, which is, yeah, that's been very similar experience for me as well. Yeah. I mean, it's like, I love ice cream, you know, and I can sit down, but if I I ate a whole gallon of ice cream, (laughs) like I'm, I'm not going to be excited about ice cream the same night. I'll probably have more the next day, but you know, too much of something is, is not good. So as you're finding with the podcast, just go, 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 go. It's like, you just have way too much ice cream. You just, just a little bit, just get enough to, to keep you excited, to keep you looking forward to tomorrow's little bowl of ice cream, you know, but you have to certainly parse it out and make sure that you're taking care of yourself because you can, like you can consume so much because you enjoy it. But then, Once you do that, like, A, you can either get into a cycle of burnout or B, it's actually compromising other areas of your life and you've kind of lost balance. So, you know, all things, you know, in moderation, even the podcast with goal, like you can't just be like, go, go, go nonstop every day. Like I've, I've done that, like, and and it was cool. I got a lot accomplished, uh, but I also was very tired and weary and wasn't really able to bring my whole self to, to life in general, because all of every, my attention and everything went into certain aspects. So that's part of that discovery phase of yourself. Yeah. yeah uh, for sure. Having gone through different experiences, right? You yeah. realize when you feel it inside of you, right? You, whether it's your thoughts, whether it's your feelings, how you feel that day. Yeah. And then you get, like you said, you know, I like the word grace, right? You give yourself a little bit of grace to just, you know, pause a little bit, not stop, 
you can still have a little bit of ice cream. I like that because <laughs> I like ice cream yeah. too. You can always have a little nibble, but at the same right. time, yeah, eating it every day isn't necessarily the best thing moving forward. I, I agree with that completely. So I love the distraction. You So you you threw in there uh, uh, the reminders, but to me, that's a distraction, but that's a positive distraction, right? So it's like throughout the day, you're getting reminders of yourself and people you can, and folks, you can, whatever you want your message to be to yourself and set a reminder, that's a great idea. I don't think I've ever thought of that, to be honest with you, as simple as that might sound, right? Simple reminders of different things that you want to accomplish, what you want to be, what you want to become. I think that's that's a great idea. I think I'm going to set that up. So that, to me, that's a, a positive distraction. So I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, for sure. I think like when it comes to even like with discipline, like with the journaling and things that you're doing, like part of what I do in my book, like I have a lot of like reflective exercises and at the end of each chapter are journal prompts. Uh, creating a, a mission statement for yourself. And I think on those days that you are kind of lagging and not feeling it, like going back and reminding yourself of who you are. It's like, here's my mission. Like, and this is who I am. And I believe in this. So sometimes that's all you need is just that affirmation and that reminder of who the hell you are and get up and let's keep this day moving. So it, it's it's not hard. It just has to be part of of the work that you do. That's awesome. That's awesome. Appreciate that. So man, as we start to bring this one in for a close, I told you before we hit record, I was going to open it up at the very end to try to dig one last piece of nugget wisdom out of you to share with the listeners today. It can be a, a message of hope. It can be a message of basically what we've talked about today. You can be anything about the book or anything like that, but I would love for you to kind of just take a couple more minutes Fill the folks with some more wisdom, right? The stories that you've shared so far today, uh, going through your EDGE acronym with your book, has been fantastic. But I'm just cool, curious if there's one more nugget of wisdom in, inside of you that we can't dig out yeah, know, what, just for the last couple of minutes. Sure. Yeah. One thing that I was thinking about as we were talking and really about discovery is for me, it's helped me, my yeses, being able to quantify my yeses and my noes you know, very easily because sometimes people bring things to you, whether it's business ideas or I don't know, entertainment things, whatever the case may be. And they want you to be a part of it. And when you know yourself, like you can say no to things because it doesn't fulfill you or it's not going where you're going. And it's, you know, kind of that cliche, like, you know, everybody who's been with you to this point may not be with you where you're going because you're changing you're changing yourself. The world that you're creating is different and not everybody's going to come with you. And, and sometimes you have to grieve the loss of some people that have been part of your journey. Uh, and that's okay. But ultimately it's like, you know, better who you are and what your journey is, what your mission is, because this work that you're doing on yourself, most of the people around you are not doing that work. So they don't understand you and they don't understand this person that you're turning into. But if you stay in that work and you continue like you're actually going to be happier, healthier. You're going to live a life where you do feel more fulfilled and you're going to be able to say yes to the things that fill you up and no to the things that don't. And I've had to tell people no many times just from the work that I've done, things that I would have said yes to, but I'm like, you know what? I like, that's a good business idea, but it's just not for me because it's not who I am and where I'm going. But I wish you success, like for real, from the bottom of my heart, it's just not, it's not for me. Fantastic. Bring it home at the very end. That's great wisdom there, right? Being able to have the, have the experience from yourself to, to say no, to say yes. You're hundred percent correct. I said this uh, in an episode, maybe last one or two that I've done is like opportunities are everywhere all the time. And there, you could be presented, you can be, anyways, but having the ability from within yourself, doing the work on yourself to be able to say yes or no, based on your skill set, based on your goals, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's awesome. I appreciate you sharing that. That's awesome. So folks are out there saying, okay, I've got to figure out how to get Jeremy's book, get the finding your edge book. I need to potentially get him actually to come in to speak to uh, my organization or something like that. I know you speak as well. Where are the best places for people to connect with you, Jeremy? Yeah. Uh, so my book is available on Amazon. So you can get the, there's paperback, there's hardcover, Audio book is available on Audible on Amazon, also Apple Books. And I actually read the book. So if you like my voice, you'll love it. If not, 
just get the paperback or the hardcover. Uh, so <laughs> that's where you can get the book itself. If you want to connect with me, I do workshops. I do speaking, marketing, consulting. You can go to my website, jeremyhazelwood.com. Um, so you'll see it's just my name.com and you'll have all the information there if you'd like. I'd love to come work with you guys and, and gals, work with your organizations, put together workshops that are going to help with leadership and balance and self-care and and all the things that are actually going to make your workforce better. Or I also do personal coaching. So if you are looking for a coach, this might be the exact episode that you needed to hear. I know Randy does some work and I do some work. So you have resources. So plug in with us. Definitely do that, folks. Uh, get plugged into Jeremy's content uh, from the stories that we shared today. That, that that was the goal from learning about Jeremy, taking from his beginning stages of life as far as his recording career, how he's developed himself in the corporate setting, but then obviously getting out here and doing his entrepreneurial thing as far as with his digital marketing agency. And then creating this book, Finding Your Edge. I just knew that this story going from beginning to end was just going to be super impactful. I was trying to get it all fit in here. I tried not <laughs> yeah. to let the episodes go too much longer yeah. than an hour, but I knew that this one was going to be jam packed full. I'm, I'm super glad that uh, you've been able to, to jump on us with us here today, Jeremy, yeah. and, and share so much wisdom, uh, your experiences, your stories. Uh, yeah. Super impactful, man. I really appreciate it. Cool. Thanks, Randy. Had fun with you today and I hope your listeners got something from this. So if you did, folks, if you did get something from this, if you wouldn't mind sharing it with your family and friends, that's the easiest and best way for me to spread the message of the Rich Mind Podcast. I'm trying to do the best I can to, number one, get better at my craft, right? Asking the proper questions, doing the proper research, uh, even just getting the podcast produced and doing it in a, in, a, in a good way for you, the listener. That's the entire goal. But to find guests such as Jeremy that has fantastic stories, as I mentioned, we're about the same age. So we kind of resonate in just in that standpoint, as far as the, the lifestyle, how life used to be back in the analog days. We talked about cassettes, yes. which is uh, super funny to even think about how life was back in the uh, 90s. Yeah. Uh, so even so we could probably have stories about even and they're the coming 80s, back, like, Randy. Imagine. Cassettes are coming yeah. back. I've seen like vinyls back and I've seen ads for cassettes. I'm like, who's buying cassettes? But sorry to interject. Go ahead. <laughs> Don't. I had no idea. I've never seen that. So yeah, I'm yeah. Not, now I'm going to keep my eyes open. Yeah. So folks, you might be seeing some cassettes out there, which, right. you know, for those of you that may or may not even know what that is. Uh, yeah, that's going to be super cool as things keep evolving. So go out there, have a fantastic day. I hope you uh, loved this episode here of the Rich Mind Podcast here with Jeremy. Go out there, grab his book, Finding Your Edge, and start going through the processes. It sounds like it's almost like a workbook. It's going to take you through the stages and the processes to try to get you towards that brighter future that maybe today sitting here right now, you might not exactly even know what that is, but this is, could be a great resource for you to try to start developing what that vision is and then for you to start taking this, uh, the steps necessary to reach your goals in the future. So go out there, as I mentioned, have a fantastic day. I look forward to coming back with another fantastic episode, another guest here very soon. I look forward to talking to you then. Bye now. Thank you for joining me on the Rich Mind Podcast. And remember, your external world is a reflection of what's going on inside of you. So focus every day on that internal battle and win within. Until next time, my friends.